Hi, Misha here. And you might have noticed it's raining. Well, I was doing a live stream earlier tonight, and a couple of folks asked me, what are my top five favorite guns? That's absurd. What kind of guns, this and that, day of the week, I don't know. But I was in the topic for the week video for the weekend, so I'm going to kind of take that and, and run with it. But I can't do top five guns. What I can do, top ten long arms. Rifles, essentially. How about that? I just, I could not do it with pistols. I, I tried, I really did, but top 10, and we're going to have some honorable mentions, but hey, that's in grand old YouTube list tradition, right? So, 10 long arms with honorable mentions, and this will just be basically story time. This is not going to be best guns, most historic. This is just going to be the guns that kind of popped into my head. They have some personal whatever. I don't know. And the fun thing is, if you were to ask me to do this video, even tomorrow, the list would be different. So, there we go. And if you'd like to help support, you know, check out the live streams. Check out the Patreon. And, if nothing else, like, share, subscribe. You know the deal. You're on YouTube. I don't have to explain. So, we'll get into the, my top ten favorite rifles. But actually, first, I guess by what's happening right now, this would be my least favorite gun in my collection. We'll begin there. Yeah, my least favorite, I guess. My finish, Valmet M78. Why? I know this seems odd. Well, it, it's kind of by default because this is one, the most recent gun that I've decided to sell out of my collection. In fact, by the time you see this video, it's probably already gone. <sighs> It's hard for me to do, but I wanted to point that out because most all the guns I own, I actively enjoy. Like, if I don't really feel something, sooner or later, it, it goes. And that was kind of the time for this. And I really think it's a nice gun. But it just doesn't really fit what I do. And hey, I need to pay for the air conditioner in the cabin. It's a pre-band, it's an import, it's an AK type gun, normally something completely up my alley. And it is, that's why I've hung on to it for a few years. But, one, there's no real story behind it, this just came in on trade back in 2020, 2021, during everything. So, no real personal connection there, no real story, just someone had it, offered it on trade. And uh, we did a video with it, had fun shooting it. But it's not one of those guns you're going to shoot a lot. Because, one, it's in 308, 76280. It is actually marked 308, but, yeah. And it uses very expensive proprietary mags. And, you know, if a part were to break, which is not likely, but if it were, yeah. So it's not one you'd really keep as a, as a daily shooter, unfortunately. And it's not one that the Finnish military ever used. Now, if they'd uh, used the M78 but in a different caliber, I could kind of let it slide, but the truth is the FDF just never used it in any version, regardless of this caliber, which they never used the caliber either. They, of course, used 762 by 39 and they used the RK-62, and the later RK-6276 and RK-95. So, while I really like it, it just... When I, ha when I was thinking about, okay, time to make some sacrifices... What could I let go of that I wouldn't regret? And then also would, you know, help the project. And while this might not have been the first gun that came to mind, it was in the top two or three. So, hope its new owner enjoys it, appreciates it. They are great. But in the end, you know, you can't keep everything. But I would say... All the other guns in this video are guns that I don't see myself turning loose of. So with that, let's begin with our first honorable mention, the Russian Molot Vepr 12, specifically the side folder. These came in thanks to a 2011 ruling on pistol grips by the ATF. Once in a while we get a break. 
and they started bringing these over. Fixed stock and folders. And this is great. It's a semi-automatic 12 gauge Russian shotgun. They're quite reliable, very beefy, and as close to real mil spec as you're going to get. And they're one of the first practical magazine fed shotguns to really come onto the market. Most all the other ones you see are essentially gimmicks. Very well built. Molot's quality is just one of those things that isn't often challenged. But it's just an honorable mention because before these came in, well, I knew Vepers existed, but it wasn't one I was just burning to um, to own. When I got it, I really enjoyed it, especially once the uh, 8 and 10 round mags became available for a good price. It does tiny bug me that it has to have the longer barrel. So much so that I've considered having it chopped down below 18 and having the flash hider permanently attached, but never have done it. It's cool, and the prices were really good. But when it comes to personal history and shotguns, you know number 10, the Benelli M4 or M1014. I mean, it's it's obvious if you ask me to pick my favorite shotgun. I want to be kind of surprising in this video with some of my picks, but I also have to be honest. It's because this has kind of all my criteria. I had wanted it for a decade before finally getting one. In fact, it was kind of one of the first higher-end guns I was finally able to afford to buy, at least new, back in 2011. And on top of that, it is just so reliable so durable it does have military service not just us but other militaries like britain too and as cool as mag feds are and they they are good just a good old-fashioned tube fed it's hard to beat when it comes to shotguns when i first encountered the m4 technically it was the quote xm 1014 during the assault weapons ban it looked very similar to this but the buttstock was pinned in the open position, and the tube only held five shells. That was just for criteria of the band. And if you went around that and added these features, you were in violation of the 94 assault weapons ban. But once that sunset, September of 2004, coming up on 20 years ago now, you could add the adjustable stock, and actually Benelli made it easy for you. Even though these would ship with a uh, standard solid stock, under that was already a pre-cut extension, so easy enough to put on. And, of course, the uh, extension here just screws right on. Easy peasy. So you could put one of these to rights in no time at all with basically no gunsmithing skills, which is good because while I'm not a master gunsmith now, I definitely wasn't nearly 15 years ago <laughs> either. I mean, it's just hard to not say this is my favorite shotgun and it does have that personal connection and it's a gun that i think all my friends have shot time and time again and it is definitely not a safe queen which means it's been used a little bit abused maybe but well loved appreciated and i think that's kind of the point but this is a very modern gun let's go back for a number Nine, or rather the honorable mention, the Canadian Ross. I remember hearing about these for years and never did see one in person for oh so very long. Infamous, but also one of the nicest military bolt actions of World War I because it started off as a sporting, sporting gun for good or ill. It also has the story of one Charles Ross, an extremely, as the British would say, eccentric man, but oh so fascinating. This is the Mark II, the 1905. There's also, of course, the Mark III. Sorry, a little hard to do one-handed. It is, of course, a straight pull, very much inspired by the Steyr Manlinker system, but extremely smooth. Firing 303 British. It has a staggered internal mag, but it actually has this where you just dump the rounds in. It's a thing, it exists. 
and no, this was not the version that you could reassemble incorrectly. That was actually the Mark III, the 1910. But I picked this one out because I think I like it slightly more. It's a little bit lighter, more interesting. Less military, more sporter gun. Plus, it came from my friend John, so there's some personal connection there. But I love old bolt actions. I love old guns with history, but these you just don't find too often, especially unsporterized or un unmolested. <laughs> and, yeah. But it's not my number nine. Only because, well, there's another straight pull that's just the cat's pajamas. The Swiss Schmidt Rubin, firing 7.5, GP11, and this is a real Schmidt Rubin, meaning it's not a K31. I decided to go with the K11. Nothing against the K31, it's a superior gun, but I do kind of like the old school carbine. As nice as the K31s are, the K11s are just a little bit posher. And I do like the furniture on it. Okay, and I think the biggest attractor is this. I love the old Bakelite style beer keg. It's just too cool not to. I also kind of like the detaching mag a little nicer on the uh, earlier series. Again, I'm not dogging on the 31s, but I don't know. I had to pick one. These are just a lot of fun to shoot. And the ammo is very accurate. The straight pull system is very smooth on these. Holds open on the last round, not empty. Very big, massive bolt, especially on the original style. Actually, I first learned about Schmidt Rubens thanks to J. Rowe's father a long time ago. And luckily over the years, there's been some really good buys on pretty much every version. And they usually come in in remarkably great condition. A nice little crest. What's fun about Swiss guns, there's not a lot of markings on them if you think about it. Serial, crest, but they're not real markings heavy. Especially as time goes on. But no, I love bolt actions and I think straight pulls are particularly interesting. Not necessarily superior but interesting so kind of picking one favorite all things i suppose at least today tonight it's the k11 number eight well the runner-up this is going to take a little explaining i used to have and i still have rules for my collection for example i still don't do black powder and I try to collect guns that are kind of within certain countries and nations and not others. Although over time, it's pretty much bled to all nations. But it's kept me focused. Well, back in the day, while I liked 9mm carbines, we really didn't have braces back then, so not really pistols. I had two things I didn't like. One, open to close bolt conversions. It just was janky. And... Two, what I used to call sticky out barrels. Again, because we didn't have braces, most of those guns would have extended barrels. Some of them would have the barrels extended a foot. I'm, th I'm looking at you, Mini Uzi. Well, one of the first guns that really got me to change my mind on this was the MP5. For one, it was a closed bolt. And I got over the sticky out barrel because they were just so cool. I think anyone under 50, and I'm sure a lot of people over 50... The MP5 is just special place. But, aside from the HK94 and some SP89s, back in the day, you were stuck with kit builds. Now, there were some good ones like Vector, and some not good ones, or at least hit or miss ones like Special Weapons. Now, believe it or not, I actually had a good Special Weapons that ran. It was in this configuration, you know, A2 stock, extended barrel. But it didn't look great. Like, the welds are a little sloppy, but it ran. I had others. I had a Bobcat that absolutely ran for shit. You just never knew what you were going to get. And they were a 1000 bucks then, 25 years ago. Yeah. But this gun here changed all that. The Pakistan POF 5 MP5. 
In 2014, this gun changed the game. Prior to it, we did have the ATI MKE imports, which were doing good. They were a good price, but they still had a lot of the old features. This was the first to get permission to have the push and pin, push pin lower and paddle mag release. It also was real marked MP5s. So when people try to call it a clone or a copy or whatever, dude, the gun says MP5. Argue with the steel. Of course, they came in as pistols, but they had the threaded and lugged barrel, so I put on a can, fake can on mine, and that way you could just slide on an A2 or an A3 stock. Pretty cool. And this gun in particular has some great memories. Well, what I can remember of the memories. Yeah, in 2014, even though the, the channel today, Mishiko, is not big, <laughs> it was tiny in 2014. This was actually, I think, the first gun I got a call and an offer on a T&E. And I did buy it. I All the guns you see here, unless I tell you otherwise, are guns that I bought with my money. But I was offered one. That was from the owner of Atlantic, Blaine. I actually met him years before back when he was smaller and before I even had a business, and he helped me out way back when. I remember the PPSH-41s. I forget which builder. I think it was, think it was before the Wise Lights. I digress. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Blaine had called me asking if I was interested in trying one of these out. Here's the thing. The day he called me, well, my wife used to go home to see her parents for about two weeks to visit. And that meant I was on vacation, which meant I was the opposite of sober, so when Blaine called me at about 3 p.m. on a Wednesday, I was baked off my ass. So, I don't know if he watches my videos much, and I don't know if he noticed or even remembers, but yeah, 10 years ago when he called me about this, I was doing my best to act sober. Probably not succeeding, but it cracked me up. I got the gun, this exact one. I've had it. I love it because, you know, you get an HK, you don't want to wear and tear it, but these POFs... For as affordable as they are, who cares? It's been a great runner. And it opened the door first for MKEs and then actual HK SP5s. And the latest SP5s are awesome with the push pins and all that. So if PLF, and these were even imported in Fort Smith, the Fed Arms. Anyway, if they hadn't kind of started to push the envelope with the ATF, the MP5 world could be very different today. And this ushered in our golden age. That was pretty long for a runner-up, but I had to give the round. But what gun is actually better in my mind than this? I fucking love this gun. The British Sterling. Specifically, this is the Mark VI carbine, but any of them, even the Wise Lights. This was the gun that changed my mind for good on such things. Like I said, I don't like open to close bolt conversions. This gun, though, was such a cool gun that I just I had to break that rule. Sticky out barrel and all. Now, originally, the one I picked up in uh, 2008, 2009 was one of the Wise Light builds. They actually did a really good job, at least on the surface, of looking like a pre band. But I just I loved it too much, and I loved the magazines. I love the history of the Sten and how the Sterling moved on all the way through the 50s and 60s and in, even into the Gulf War. We don't get many British imports. Very basic tube gun. This was a way to make a seemingly simple gun, but just make it very well. So this has everything. It has a great story in my head. I remember getting this and loving it so much. And it also has a connection to my business. The very first gun I received on my license that I called up, ordered, sent my FFL, and got to my door. The very first time I had a gun come to my door, signed UPS, and that was that. And that amazing feeling of running to the computer to log it in. Back then, even logging in was exhilarating. Was a Wise Light Sterling. But not the standard one. They actually did about a dozen Mark 7s, which was the tiny pistol version. The only reason I sold my Mark 7 is because I found a pre-band Mark 7 along this pre-band Mark 6. And back then, these British ones really didn't go for crazy money. I think I paid 3000 for the pair, 1500 each, with two mags each. I do kind of regret selling the Mark 7 pistol. 
but without a stock or any way to put one on or even a brace, uh, yeah, I, I, I regret it, but I don't beat myself up. But I would kill myself if I sold the Mark VI. I just, I love this gun so much. The Wise Lights aren't bad, but, I mean, this is just the cat's pajamas on how to do it. And it has that connection to my business. I, I really enjoy British guns. And, of course, I enjoy Star Wars a whole lot. It was probably my first thing that I got kind of into as a child. Yeah. This just changed my perspective. And I'm going to be honest, too. With the cost of ammo today in 2024, people used to kind of say, what's the point of a PCC or 9mm carbine? I bet they're not saying it now. Because even with 223 and definitely 762 by 39 up and 545, almost impossible to get, and 308 expensive, at least 9mm is still reasonably affordable. So you can go out all day and shoot either of these. And, of course, you can bring the kids along because very light recoil. And, you know, if you do need to use these as an anti-varmint gun, 9mm, especially self-defense rounds, they're plenty potent out of long barrels. And finally, this is something we featured early on in the channel, these shrouds from e &L are awesome. And I really like it for this pre-ban because it actually doesn't have set screws directly against the barrel. There's one screw on the bottom, and that actually tightens a collar that squeezes the barrel and i've had it on here for a long time and it's never shot off unlike that one scene from uh the commando video last year but no when i thought about this video when people asked me this was literally the first gun that came to mind it's got to be on the list i don't know why lately i've just been kind of really getting off on the uh the sterling in fact i want to bring it out to the cabin to shoot very soon again. But really enjoy the POF as well. And it's more of a main kind of mainline gun that probably more people can get behind. Oh well. And of course this also gets into the collector's market because even though these were kind of hidden gems for years, I think those days are over. So yeah, number eight was a long one. That's what she said. With number seven, we're gonna go back in time a bit, but not quite as far into a very interesting era in between bolt actions and select fire guns that brief period really of self-loading guns thus semi-auto only and the runner-up honorable mention is the swedish ag42 jungman or lungman as it's known here even if that's not really the correct name just because i love 6.5 sweet as a cartridge and I think it's really cool that a nation that's relatively small created in very short order a very effective, very dependable semi-automatic rifle. Almost as a, you better not, towards the Nazis. And maybe it worked, because the, the Nazis didn't. But they didn't make tons of these. And they're not all that easy to find in America. And they're just so mechanically cool. Detaching 10 round mag, although with two catches, it's not going to be quick detaching. And it does use direct impingement. Yeah, the AR was not the first to use that. Okay, internal piston, whatever you like to call it. And it uses a tilting tipping bolt. Pretty common. But the charging system, well, that's where this is just weird. You know it, but we're going to do it again because it's always so fun. I know what they were going for here, but Jesus. It's easy to use, especially with gloves. Maybe that's it. Maybe if you had gloves on, it wouldn't feel so bad. But yeah, they only made, I think, 30,000 of these. Just enough to say they could, only for a couple of years. So they're not very common in the U.S., which is actually why this is at least my honorable mention. Because while I knew these existed... I hadn't known about them for long, and I just stumbled into one at a local shop, this exact gun here. They had it on the wall for 500 bones, which seemed like a good deal at the time, 20-some-odd years ago, and they couldn't move it. They also had an FN-49. I ended up getting both, and I actually traded for both. I gave them a U.S.-made Walther PPK-S 
nothing special but nothing bad, one of the Inner Arms Ranger guns. And an aftermarket, really crummy, but this was still during the saw opens band, so it mattered. 31 round Glock mag, it was metal, not even plastic. Those two things got me this gun. And they were thrilled to do it. And you know what? They probably sold that crappy mag and that U.S. made Walther, because they were pretty hot at the time, easier than they would this, because probably a lot of people didn't know what it was. And yeah, 6.5 Swede wasn't the, wasn't the easiest to get. Really loved this gun for its obscurity. But I don't shoot it all that often for whatever reason. No, instead, my actual pick is... Not the M1 Garand, but the M1 Carbine. I have nothing against the Grand, but I've always just kind of thought the M1 Carbine was cool. I remember j Row used to, you know, in good spirit, mock me, calling this a Mickey Mouse gun. And I get it. Little poo-poo cartridge. But I just always had a soft spot for it. It was a little bit bigger than the Grand. And it was always a little hard getting a nice example. You saw a lot of the Universals and Ivory Johnsons. And you saw a lot of reworks and whatnot. And I, but it was always hard to get one in original World War II configuration. And I always thought it would be cool to get a postal meter or an IBM. Although, really, all the makers are equal. I just I, I thought IBM was cool. And some years ago, I got this from a family member who actually got it from a church member. And it's pretty straight and correct for a World War II Example, of course, we have the push button safety. We have the simple flip rear sight, two rivet, flat bolt top. No bail log. High wall stock. Proper. Trigger guard, proper butt stock, and I do have some appropriate mags for it out there as well. Again, I just it'd be hard to improve upon it. it does have the P stamp on the stock too, and the stamp. I it just makes me happy. And has done. So I got what I consider one of the best, for me, examples of one of my favorite World War II guns. I don't care if they made millions of these. This one's mine. I enjoy it. And I enjoy shooting M1 Carbine. You can still get the ammo today pretty easily. I've even featured, you know, some of the replicas. And there have been some good replicas, of especially the M1A1 that we've done on the channel. We should do that again too. So if you really ask me what's my favorite World War II gun in this category it's probably this and i also like the carbine because in some ways it was more forward thinking than the garand detachable 15 later 30 round mags select fire was very quickly introduced with the m2 and m3 heck night vision was introduced with the m3 not what we'd know today but this is one of the first guns to have night fighting in mind lightweight compact you know 18 inch barrel yeah it has its you know detractions but you see the genesis here of what would become the more the modern day assault rifle. And we can own these legally. And uh, they're, you know, a lot of fun to collect. You can get all kinds of makers, configurations. I just, I just really enjoy the M1 carbine. And, uh, you know, they even come with the cool fighting knife. And they have their place in D-Day. Growing up, one of my dad's Really good friends. He was also a carpenter. Actually uh, jumped into D-Day. And he didn't talk much about the war. Didn't talk a whole lot about guns, but he wasn't against them. But he sure liked to carpentry things. And while the version he would have had would have been the folding stock, these were around too. I'm sure some paratroopers once on the ground ended up with M1 carbines. Another friend's dad drove a landing craft in the Pacific, and his gun was a full stock M1. Just, you know, it was kind of a PDW, because he wasn't expected to debark the boat. But no, I feel quite confident with this is 
the number seven in my favorites. Again, today at least. We complete the bottom half of the video, number six. Look at it, Enfield. I, like I said, I really like Bolt Action. I, and I was, I was around for the right time. There was just kind of that heyday of Bolt Actions. And I always thought the infill was cool. But my runner-up is the good old number five Mark I Jungle. Actually, I think the first gun I ever received as a gift at Christmas was a Jungle Carbine. Actually, via miscommunication, they were just on the market at the time. But it's not this one. I did sell it. I kind of feel bad that I don't feel bad because it was in okay shape. But the uh, FFL kind of screwed my dad ordering it. He was supposed to order one, you know, hand selector, very good to excellent. He ended up getting the good, maybe even fair, but charging him. Anyway, we don't need to go into small towns. But I still like the jungle. It's a cool configuration, really the last major infield. Flash hider, bayonet lug, the short furniture. These are very unique guns. Although you had to be a little aware to not get ripped off. Rubber recoil pad. Side sling bars. Lots of lightning cuts, like on the bolt handle here. Shorter rear sight. Well, at least shorter range. Yeah, there were some fake jungles made. But honestly, if you paid a little attention, they were pretty easy to spot. For all kinds of reasons. But the jungle's always had a little special space in my heart. But the problem is, you really probably don't want to shoot one. They are pretty harsh on the recoil. Dumbass me tried to shoot one one-handed back in the day. And uh, I didn't hurt myself, but it was a miracle. Don't, don't do that, kids. These hard rubber butt plates. Maybe once they're a little softer than not now. But the jungle does stand out to me. And I like 303. And... It actually took me a minute to find a couple of nice infields back in the day. Most of them I ran into have been sporterized or whatever, except for the Indians. You could get Indian guns all day long. But, well, if you're going to go infield, you got to go classic. The good old smelly. The number one Mark III of World War I fame. Actually, this one's a uh, number... One Mark One Star Star Star. I just picked it. I've got a few, but I love the full wood look. I mean, who doesn't love full wood with the cut off? All the gobbledygook still in 303. Windage rear sight. Yeah, of course they deleted a lot of those features during the war. It's really fun to collect these. But the reason I picked this one, it's got the volley sights. I just really thought these were neat. I was hearing about them. This wouldn't be the one I would use as a particular shooter. That'd probably be my Lithgo. But I don't, I don't know. I just always had a fascination with the infield back then. I still do today. There's a lot to be said. They're, they're a lot of fun in the bolt system. They're, they're uniquely British. And I think the market always kind of valued these more than, say, Carcanos and, and whatnot. Very cool, iconic bolt actions that I really enjoyed since I got into military firearms, really firearms in general. So I just had to mention it. What do you think? What's your favorite infield variation? Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of the first half of my video. Again, today this is one I picked. Tomorrow would be a different one. I will say that since we're not including handguns, and for that matter, small PCC types in this one, I will do a second video focusing on those, just to be fair. Anyway, I need a break. Do you need a break? Let's take a break. Well, it's still raining. I'm not even sure if it's supposed to rain today, but... Yeah. How are you enjoying the video? How's it going? Need a snack? Well, let's get on with the other half of the list. Well, did you have a good smoke? Take a drink? Eat a bite? All three? Well, let's begin the second half with kind of the era that bridges old and new. The 7.62 NATO era. And of course, you knew an FAO had to be in the video. 
And as I've said in the past, it always goes back and forth as to what's my favorite. The British L1A1 is usually there, but today is one of those days when I'm feeling like the Israeli SBL receiver light barrel row mat. I don't know. Today I'm just kind of feeling this gun. <clears throat> Not much to say about it. I mean, you've seen it in a recent video. Jero's father had one of these, so I saw it quite early on. They're not super common, but they were actually very cheap in the 80s when they came around, at least compared to actual Belgian examples. I don't know. I like the fact that these are built with real military service parts and that the receivers, at least the forgings, were original Belgian. A lot of history there. I love the, the early style. Most FAL imports were, of course, of the later pattern. So, not many early styles, even if this is technically a kit build. But yeah, it's in my top two or three FALs of all time, and one of the lesser known imports. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. The FAL, it's a legendary gun. Same goes for the L1A1, and really was the right arm of the free world. And it's actually a gun I was into really before getting into the AK, the Kalashnikov. I know the channel kind of mostly has a lot to do with AKs, but we'd have a lot more FAL content on here if there were, well, new FAL topics, either new guns or at least new parts kits coming in. But as with most things, surplus, these dried up. When I got into firearms, it was still a good time to get into FALs. I might have missed the absolute high water mark, but at least I kind of caught them on the, on the descent. <clears throat> had a few good years with them. You, as you know, I also really like my Argentine, Argentinian FMAP FALs, and I have a lot of respect for the Brazilian Imbels besides. But again, this is just the honorable mention. What's actually my pick? Well, it's something that I've really kind of taken and made my own. The Italian Beretta BM59 series. I just really enjoyed learning about these, studying these. And I recall even as a kid, you'd see these sitting on their bipods on tables, and even then they were rare and cool. And I think they got a lot more attention because they did look like an M1 Grand M14. But this is Italy showing America how it's done. I just really enjoy shooting them too. I thought about picking the standard stalker, but visually I thought having the paratrooper would be more interesting. You can easily swap stocks out between them. And this one has the QD muzzle device, grenades, sights, you know the deal. And just really enjoy like this uh, folding stock. It sort of kind of reminds me of the Ruger Mini 14 stock that folds. And I'm probably about as equally comfortable firing 7.62 NATO. But that's okay. It locks in. Very easy to do. It's just kind of neat to see a paratrooper's version in this particular gun. is quite interesting on the historical front. I'm not going to say objectively it's the best 7.62 NATO gun we have. But just for me, it holds a special place. Really am wanting to do a big video looking at the AR-10, the M14, M1A, BM-59, SETME, G3, a couple of FALs. Kind of put them head to head. The classic 60s NATO battle rifles. One definitely had to be in the list. One complaint we used to have about these mags. But actually, while they're not cheap or readily available... They've become more affordable, more obtainable in the last few years. So that's good. Even some parts kits have shown up, which have made things nice. And you can even build one of these by modifying an M1 Grand receiver. This one isn't. This is a Beretta receiver. But <clears throat> it's a good bit of modding, but you can do it. And it was a very cost-effective way for Italy as well. Again, I don't think it was the best, but you know... For the cost, for the bang, for their buck, Italy got a lot out of these. And it's one of those guns that I really, really deep dove into and had wanted to get one for years, but financially they'd just been out of reach. 
it seemed like these were just always expensive. And they're still expensive today. But, you know, I have a couple. And I super enjoy them. But, yeah. That's where we begin this half. But, before we really move in to the modern stuff, we have to go bolt action one more time with number four. The Arasaka series. Those who know me know there had to be at least some Japanese guns on the list. Unfortunately, getting some auto type 89s or 64s isn't possible and most likely, likely will never be. But, you know, we've got plenty of bring back 38s and 99s and I've really enjoyed them over the years. You may have noticed the four hour video I put out on them last year could have clued you in. <coughs> And I was interested in these long before I even started buying guns as an adult. And was, you know, kind of made aware of them thanks to the old Tales of the Gun episode back when History Channel was, well, history. They just made the Arasaka sound quite creative and cool. And this one here, which is my runner-up, really does exemplify all the things a Type 99 could have. Top cover. AA sights. Intact chrysanthemum. Fold down monopod. Full length cleaning rod. High grade blued finish. Yeah, these pre-war and early war 99s were very well made. Of course, the 38 before it, in some ways, was even better made. But this firing 7.7. .7. I was lucky. I happened to get into J Japanese guns at the right time and met the right people, the group over at Bonsai, other collectors. And I was also lucky because, locally, very few gun shops, very few gun people, very few gun shows really... Gave a lot of credence to Arasaka's, any of them. If one did get attention, though, it would be a gun like this, with all the features, good condition, chrysanthemum, maybe a paratrooper. But like I said, this is my honorable mention. So what's my actual pick for this slot? Well, it's certainly a related design, even if it looks like it might have Down syndrome compared to the original version. The so-called Substitute Type 99, the last ditch. My first last ditch was literally given to me in a gun shop if I promised never to shoot it. That was actually a Series 25. But, man, have I enjoyed collecting these. And in the beginning, I could get them for little or nothing or a good trade. Over the years, they finally kind of gained collectability. But even today, I know some collectors that they like the 38s and the 99s. But they just don't understand this. Going back to the Tales of the Gun episode, as interesting as they made the early Arasaka sound, it was actually the late war ones. It sounded fascinating. Remember, I couldn't look on the TV screen to see the pictures, so I was imagining it in my mind's eye. And then we have this. And what's fun to collect with these, while well, the early guns pretty much look the same from each factory, there are some minor variations, but once you get to the late war, each factory is really turning out a very different gun. I could have picked any of my uh, substitutes, last stitches, but I went with this one because it is a Ropel. It does have a chrysanthemum. It's actually harder to find a late war gun with a chrysanthemum than an early. It's got all the features. It's a cylindrical bolt knob. Of course, the uh, welded safety, short upper handguard, two-piece lower. I love how no cleaning rod, no sight protectors, no adjustable sight, but damn it, we have to have the bayonet lug. You know, Germany got rid of the bayonet lug on the Kriegs model, but not Japan. Nope. To the very end, they had lugs, even if everything else pretty much went away. This doesn't even have the rails for the dust cover. And, of course, it has the famous wooden butt plate held on, usually with three nails, sometimes even two nails, 
whatever. They even quit machining this here. They took the fuller grooves out of the stock. Yeah, and each factory made a few different styles of shortcuts. I also like the uh, Korean, the Jensen versions. But yeah, I just kind of picked this one to represent. As much as I like the early Urasakas, when you look at my gun room, I just have a couple of those, but I've got quite a wall of last ditches. Part of it is I find them each interesting, and I just don't know which I could sell. Part of it too is, though, they were they were so affordable back in the day. It wasn't that people didn't know what they had. They just they just didn't care. And what's sad is some of these late war guns appear to have never been fired. Looks like they left the factory, were packed in crates, warehoused, and then taken by USGIs after the war home, and probably hung over the fireplace. Not all, of course, but it's really cool to pick up a gun that made it through World War II, 80 years old, never been fired. And it's just interesting. Most of these don't have import marks. They haven't been re-blue. They haven't been re-arsenaled. They're just the straight dope. And they're definitely a piece of history. They have a story to tell about Japan's war and their willingness to wage it and take on... It's a whole thing. And don't get me wrong, I'm not sympathetic. They, they went at Pearl Harbor, but they knew it was coming. But I can't help but respect their commitment and willingness. Even if the war, and especially their treatment of prisoners, was absolutely not comprehensible... The workers, the individuals doing this, they would make guns at the cost of their own lives thanks to bombing raids and all that. And the fact that they were able to turn out guns at all in 1944 and 45, when you see pictures of the the rubble that they were working from, it's a testament. The same could be said, though, for Russians in late 1941 and 1942 and their efforts to repel. It's almost as if, uh, yeah, enemies... But no, just uh, when it comes to bolt actions, I really like a lot of them. But there's one that's really just my special interest area. It's Japanese guns. And that is thanks in great part to the friends I met collecting these, many of them, no longer with us today. I mean, when I met them 20, 30 years ago, they were net young men and, you know, time but anyway, not to be a downer, but it does mean a lot to me. And uh, frankly, it was a good investment for guns that were given cheap or free. Well, they're no longer cheap or free, for whatever that's worth. But you've bared with me through my old bolt actions. I'll uh, quit torturing with those and, you know, we'll go more modern again. With number three, we do go modern in the AR family. My LMT Estonian R20 reference rifle. Part of their modular system. Even though if it's an external piston, I really, really enjoy shooting this gun. And with these reference rifles, at least for this customer, LMT is exactly giving what I would want. A gun made as close to military spec as LMT can do. Of course, they've done the New Zealand, they've done the British, and hopefully they do more. They, you know, pin and welded the barrel. M-lock handguard. Now, if I wanted to do a complete authentic, I'd have some gobbledygook on the handguard, but I realized, you know, my gun, I really just kind of enjoy having rail panels here. And I even added the proper Hollison setup up here for when Fox and Jiro and others shoot it. Aren't I considerate? But this gun has just been really great, and I think LMT has really innovated on the AR. This is pretty much the last word in it. I think they've taken the platform as far as it can go and still be an AR at all. There's really nothing I can say that I don't like about it. It even came with the right slings. I didn't have to go source it. It came with the right iron sights. Of course, it didn't come with the optics. But it did come with rail panels, rail covers. 
These are not cheap, but for a collector. But I also like it that this is a collectible gun that you would definitely shoot. This isn't really meant to be a safe queen. They didn't put a high grade finish on it, engravings, carvings, special edition marks. Nope. They, they did it exactly how I would have done it. And I did need a modern AR-15. I don't have many. Most of mine are retro ARs. Even like the quick change barrel system. So I wanted to give acknowledgement to that. Plus we're looking at a gun that modern day European nations using. Can't imagine why they're antsy. I mean, they've got Russia as a neighbor. But anyway, they seem to be antsy. But what would actually be my top AR pick? I bet it won't surprise you. Come on, you knew it had to be here. I did consider the SP-1, but I don't really shoot it anymore because those have gotten so collectible. Now, with Colt's LE-6920 US SOCOM and a very rare gesture from them, they gave customers what they actually wanted, basically their version of a reference rifle. This is as is close to current day M4A1 from Cole through FN as you can realistically get. And it's pretty well kitted out from the factory. All I did to mine is I replaced the extended A2 with a surefire and pinned that on. Correct barrel. It even comes with the Knight's Armament handguard, side sling, sling mount. It comes with the standard M4 stock, but that's okay. I wanted to put a SOP mod on it. Comes with the MB safety. And, of course, I put an aim point. And it comes with a Matek rear sight. And if that's not enough, it even comes with correct markings. From the M4A1 to the U.S. property. It's, it's, it's good. I mean, for Colt, it's amazing. But it, even for any other manufacturer, it'd be, it'd be pretty well on point. Yeah, there's a few things you can nitpick, but who wants to do that? It's great. And this will probably be the last configuration of AR-15 that the U.S. military uses in large numbers. I mean, it's kind of at the end of its life cycle after 60 years. But I really am a big fan of the M4. Again, kind of an under-50 thing. This was the new hotness in the 90s post, you know, the Somalia incidents. And it's a very smooth shooter. It's not just that I like it for its configuration. I really enjoy how this gun shoots. There's something about a way a properly made Colt. They're not overgassed. They're internally smooth in a way that a lot of ARs aren't. And they're MP-tested barrels and bolts. And, of course, if something does break, standard parts. So, hey, I could not put it on the list. Because when I think of ARs, especially like modern shooters, this is the one I think of the most. And it kind of ticks all my boxes. And when I was young and getting into guns, you could not get Colts. First it was the assault weapons ban, but even after that was lifted, Colt just would not sell direct and because you had to kind of get them through third parties. They were expensive. So they were pretty unattainium for a while. And to be able to get something like this for a reasonable sum, I thought one of these came out for around fourteen, fifteen hundred, with all the kit, they were worth it. Because if you took a standard LE6920 and tried to make it into this, it would end up costing you more. Heck, even just the Knight's quad rail and ambi safety would set you back. But yeah. Had to be on here. It just had to be. And of course, if we're going to talk AR-15s, well, we also have to talk at number... Number two. It's Kalashnikov time. And for the honorable mention, my SLR-100H Bulgarian receiver built with a Hungarian AK-55 parts kit including the original barrel. I've always liked and appreciated the original AK Type 3 or AK-47, the mill gun. But we've never had true imports of these. 
Now, you're going to say the Polytech Legend. Or maybe the Arsenal SA-93. <clears throat> Those are no more correct than this gun. That's because by the time we had some automatic AK imports in the 80s, no one around the world was making the original milled AK. Arsenal was making milled receivers. Obviously, China could make them too. But they were all press and pin barrels. And in the case of the Legend... You had a lot of modern features like a stamped trigger guard and mag catch, three rivets. <clears throat> you had a cast front sight gas, uh, gas, excuse me, front sight base. I've been talking for a while. And if you look at the SA93 from Arsenal, of course they were imported as sporters, and they too are based on a more modern design. These SLR 100s were built with original parts, Hungarian parts. The only thing not really original, the receiver. But even it is an authentic Bulgarian machined receiver. No better or worse than the Chinese. Now, of course, these were put together by a few different companies. Gordon Tech, Blue Ridge, Ohio. Mine here is MSC. I actually liked it for a few reasons. For one, it has the original catch. I did like the Blue Ridges for having... They still had threaded in, I mean, excuse me, press and pin barrels, but they looked threaded in because they actually filled this in and welded the hole up. So it looked really nice. Another thing with these, they didn't have the rear swivel. Some had it in the stock, but it's easy enough to cut your receiver and put one in. But they do have the original barrel, and uh, it is still threaded the way they got around it because these were made during the ban. They simply tack welded the nut in place. I never bothered to untack weld mine. But no, I really like how this gun shoots. It's very smooth, not over gassed. Very nice bolt throw. In fact, I liked it so much after getting it, I actually sold my Polytech Legend. I know that seemed like sacrilege to, mine, but, to, to some, but that's how I am. I'd rather have authentic, correct then that's what completely is collectible. Besides, someone else will enjoy it more than me. Me and the legend, I don't know. I just... I think in my mind, the legend's kind of a victim of its own hype. They are good guns. But to me, they're just not three, $4,000 good guns. And to me, this is more authentic to an AK Type 3 because at least most of the parts original 50s, early 60s era. And I've also just kind of had a sneaking love for the Hungarian series of guns. You know, the AKM M63, the later AK63, the AMD65 for sure. I don't have always a good reason for why I like things. This gun just makes me happy. And since it is technically a kit build with used parts, I have no problem at all going out and shooting it enjoying it, and at the end of the day, that's what's important to me when it comes to firearms. But again, it's my runner-up, and uh, no prizes for guessing the actual number two slot gun. The Russian Arsenal Izhmash, today Kalashnikov of concern, SGL3194. This was my number one video in my top AKs, and I really tried to make it something else just to surprise you. But if I did, I'd be lying. It's Russian, and we never thought we'd get a Russian AK. Honestly, we were pretty happy just with the Sega Hunters. And then we got the pistol grip fixed stock guns and 76239. That seemed great. We started getting the 545. That seemed even greater. -er -er. But when the folders came out, <clears throat> even though some poo pooed them at the time, not really getting the point. For those of us in the know, Getting a true 100 series folder was was just a thing. I've gone on and on in the past about these, so I'm not going to you know bug you too much here now. While this was an excellent example in AK-74M, after all, we were able to get it from Izhmash because kind of the opposite reason on, on the AK milds, these were in current production, I did make a few changes. I put on the push button spring-loaded takedown. I put on Russian handguards versus the U.S. ones. <clears throat> and 
And I put on the correct later style brake. Yeah, the original 74s look fine on these, but if you're going to do an AK-74M clone, I wanted to go, go correct. Now, one thing I didn't do is I never installed the grip reinforcing plate over the pistol grip. I considered it, but I wanted to keep the rivet work on my gun factory. So if I'd put it in, these rivets would have, would have been U.S. done. Plus, of course, it all costs money. So with any clone, with any build, we all have our lines, just like the gun up here. <clears throat> it's not 100% correct for a Type 3, but it's enough to make me happy. I guess this isn't 100% correct for a 74M, but it's more than enough to make me happy. It was just amazing that Arsenal, later fine, was able to get these in the country at all. Sad that they disappeared June of 2014, and the way the political situation's going, we'll probably never come back, unfortunately. Even if they do, it'll be a long time from now. <clears throat> and what's funny is the SGLs, Segas, were quite affordable for a number of years. This was not a rich man's gun. It was one of the better, cheaper, good quality AKs at the time. How things have changed, right? <clears throat> now it has to be one of my favorites. Just to have a military correct Russian Kalashnikov at what was the time the current gun. Keep in mind, this is really before the AK-12, AK-15s. Later versions had come out, so we were getting pretty much the current military issue guns. Yeah. Remember, too, in October of 2009, KVAR Arsenal had their AK stimulus plan when they had the SGL-21 fixed stock for $4.99, and they had the shotgun for like $4.49, and that was retail. That wasn't dealer. <laughs> yeah, things change. But it, it's the true definition of it was good while it lasted. And I enjoy shooting it too. I don't have it out all the time. That's mostly because of the ammo. It's hard to find 545 these days. But I at least try to take her out once a year. In fact, her last outing was in uh, March or April of last year. So, yeah, it's about due for at least another run. It's just a shame when a good gun like this gets condemned to just sit in a box for all of eternity. I get it. It's more collectible. It's probably the wiser thing to do. But it's not the fun thing to do. And I'm here to have fun. Alright. We're about to get to number one. We've already knocked out FALs, ARs, AKs. What will it be? Number one, or at least the runner-up. The Korean Daewoo K1A1. You know... I never heard people say bad things about the Daewoo's, but they were very inexpensive, even after the ban era. And even when you heard Daewoo, you thought of the K2, rightfully so. But I like the underdog, the little K1. And it's kind of a miracle these were imported, because they did have to alter them a bit to make them legal. The barrel had to be extended out because the original was only about 11 inches. But they didn't go to 16 inches and then put the flash hide around like you'd expect. They actually brought it out to about 14, and then they permanently attached the flash hider. It's one of the first instances I can think of them doing that, kind of doing the pin and weld job. <clears throat> and they did a very good job, too, of affixing it. Now, unlike the K2, which was a gas piston, this is direct impingement, or internal piston if you prefer. It has a reciprocating bolt, rotating lugs, because the Daewoo factory actually was a turnkey Colt operation. And this was really their first effort. Well, they did the uh, M16A1 Korean variant, known as the 603K. This is really their first like domestic effort here. And I really found this stock cool. Very much inspired by the grease gun 
It actually has three positions, fully out, middle, and in. And it's one of the most comfortable collapsible stocks. Typically wire stocks are pretty bad. But it actually has a rubberized butt plate. It's curved. And of course, this is a very gentle shooting gun too. So that helps. Of course, uh, A1 inspired grip. But with an FAL inspired storage compartment. I really like that these are in some ways very familiar. But in other ways, very unique. Again, the K2 is by rights a more famous gun. But I think the K1, A1, K1, A is just more interesting. It's one of those relics of the 80s you just don't see. And it just goes to show that you could get a quality gun for not a ton of money. And it was an AR, but not an AR. If you've never handled a Daewoo, if you get a chance, do so. Heck, if you get a chance, fire one. It'll make you a believer. Speaking of... Moving on to an actual entry. Just as with the Arasaka, the FAL, the AK, you knew the Swiss SIG, at least one of them had to be on the list. And if you're going to go SIG, you got to go with the original here. The STGW-90, or its civilian counterpart, the PE-90. The classic gun... <clears throat> And for years, these were unbelievably hard to find and expensive. Yeah, I know today with JDI, San Imports, they're not cheap. But, thanks to Dave and plus all the PE90 imports from like Trident and others, they're at least in sight. Because if you go back before this time, a pre-band gun like this was easily 10k. And a 5.51 was easily 15K. Kind of makes 4 or 5K seem a lot more reasonable, doesn't it? And that's for a new gun versus a used gun. With my love of AKs and stuff, it's, it's no wonder. And these really are Swiss quality. Towards the beginning of the video, we looked at the Schmidt Rubin. This is truly its worthy successor. In a lot of ways that matter count this is a gun really built around the buy once cry once mentality even in switzerland they're expensive for the military but the idea is that they issue someone this gun at the age of 18 it's still usable when they're 48 58 68 with only maybe replacing the mags the buttstock a few other parts but the receiver the barrel they're meant to last. Plus, hey, Swiss Cross. These guns are still pretty gushy today, but they've actually entered the realm of possibility. A lot of people, myself included, who never thought they could afford one, thanks to the way things have been, can. In fact, some people have made entire SG55 collections. And that helps because... SIG USA's SIG 556, it was just a pale imitation. It didn't have to be. In fact, in 2006 when it came out, I was very hopeful. I even bought one. I even bought one of the classics. And I liked them, but they never quite felt right. You know what I mean? Good, but this gun was supposed to be something great. I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is the best gun ever made. But when it comes to military guns, guns meant to be mass-produced and tough enough to survive conscripts and service and beating around, but still maintain accuracy, reliability, it's, it's at the top, much like the Schmidt Rubin. On a professional level, working with JDI sent imports since 2016-2017, has been very beneficial, I'm not going to lie. Those pink guns in particular really helped me. In fact, those uh, three guys who bought the pink guns, I greatly appreciate it. You helped me pay my house off. No, no joke. I definitely owe you a beer at the very least. And there's been a few other guns like that that really did a runaway success. 
I try to be fair when I sell such things, but it is my living, and these have been a big part of it. Also, those set me's from Markle Mark have helped a lot, too. On a personal level, this particular gun was a Christmas gift from San Imports JDI. Oh, I think it was before the COVID. So I think 2019, I had to stop and think. Might have been around after. It was either right before or right after. So either 19 or 22. <laughs> I think it was 19, though. But either way, there's a certain sentimentality there. And these PE90s used were great for me. Because, again, I'm a shooter. So you didn't have to worry about popping the cherry on a brand new gun. They'd already been fired. And the price was less than even a new JDI. I've seen them on Gunbroker for as low as 3500 I know that sounds crazy. That's not cheap. I know. But again, consider I grew up looking at these guns, no bayonet lug even, for ten k. So 3500 with a bayonet lug, relatively speaking, it felt cheap. But the thing about a gun like this, it's not what you pay for it. It's what you can sell it for. And I do sincerely feel... A gun like this, or maybe an HK, is worth it. You're not going to lose money. Where you lose money on high-end guns are your super fancy custom 1911s and ARs. If they make you happy, that's amazing, and that's great. Just don't expect to go sell your Wilson or whatever for what you paid for it new. That's just a different market. But a gun like this... Again, or like an HK. As long as you didn't buy them crazy high, they hold their value very well. And since it is a blend of AR, AK, and HK, even with the sights and little this and little that, it kind of is the culmination of my, of my entire collection. Therefore, it should definitely be my number one. But it's not. That's right. You got two runners-up. Two honorable mentions at the last slot. But, well, then what is my number one favorite long gun of all time? My number one gun. The gun that's most important to me. A Stevens Model 94C. Some of you know why, some may not. It's something I haven't really been up to talking about until the you know, last year or so. But those who follow the channel know that my father died three years ago. In fact, as I'm recording this, it was uh, just the anniversary of his funeral about a week ago. Three years now. And there were only a couple of guns I cared about, and we didn't even go through them until my mother was ready, which was September of that year, and I inherited two. This is one of them. And this is very likely the first firearm I ever shot. Uh, obviously with him right there, because I was three, maybe four years old. So that's already pretty important. But more important even than that, he himself got it from his own father, the man who raised him, and that would have been back in the late 1940s. It's hard to date these exactly, but <clears throat> it definitely was made between 1940 and 1960 based on the maker's mark. There's been debate if it does or doesn't have the date code. But it was probably made right around they started date coding, which was 49. So, it's been in my family for generations now. And a lot of kids learned how to shoot on it. And a lot of game have been killed with it. And it's just one of those family relic pieces. Wouldn't be worth much of anything to anyone else. But to me and my family... It's, uh, it's priceless because 
There's a lot of great memories here and a lot of connection to our past and to those we've lost. First for his father, who back then was a game warden, and then now for me to him. Things like that matter a lot. And the gun itself is in a battle with a little shooter. And they were ahead of their time at Stevens because uh, ambidextrous release. You can actually flip it either way. And she still works. Still shoots just fine. Single shot. 410. Three inch chamber. It's got a built in extractor. Of course, external hammer for charging. It has a sight. Um, would it surprise you to learn no 1913 rail on top? <laughs> there are some variations in these, but this is a very standard gun for, for what it is. Just an American classic. And, yeah, I'm ready to wear... I want to shoot it again. I did do a video on it and the other gun on my personal channel soon after I took them home. But it just took me some time to want to do them on this channel. Now the problem is, <laughs> finding 410 shells. You'd, you'd think they were made in Russia as hard as they are to find. What I want to do, you know, of course, we're working on the cabin and the range. I think this will definitely come out with us on the inaugural shooting trip once the cabin's done. You know, I'm a pretty independent person, have been for years, but I I really wish I had my father to kind of bounce the ideas of the cabin off of just to hear him say it's the right decision because it has been a big purchase. It has been very daunting, picking contractors, picking things. Sometimes it's just nice for someone to tell you it's a good good idea. You're doing right. My mother's been fully supportive of it, and she says he would be proud and happy I'm doing it. And that, that feels good to hear. But it'd be better to hear from him. But since we can't do that, I'll take it out and shoot it. I haven't shot it since I got it. Just haven't really been in the mood. But I think out there, the place he loved the most, the cabin land, would be a good place and time to share and something to share with you guys, the internet, to really kind of drive home what shooting, shooting sports, hunting, all that means to a lot of us. It's not about violence. It's about family. It's about time outdoors. It can be about self-defense. It can be about putting meat on the table. I grew up eating a lot of wild game in the winter. A lot of fish in the summer. It's just kind of a way of life. I really like AKs and ARs. I love historical bolt actions. But it can definitely go deeper. And should go deeper. And I think that's something we should convey to those who don't uh, you know, understand guns or haven't grown up with guns is those kinds of feelings that they can inspire in us. At any rate, it's one of those few guns that literally could never be replaced. So it's one of those guns that I'll guard and pass down to my descendants. And uh, there it is. How it goes. But, yeah, that's where I am. Sometimes I can be a sentimental fool, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> what do you think, guys? That's my list for you. I probably cheated a little bit with uh, runners-up and honorable mentions, but I did my best. <laughs> and there we have it. As I said at the beginning, these aren't the best most historical, best values, best buys. They aren't even maybe the most meaningful guns I own. It's kind of a combination of all those things and also none of those things. I don't know. 
And number one, I hope, really drives home the point that it's not about money. Not at the end of the day. And many things we think we need, we really don't. And many things that seem irreplaceable, well, most of them can be replaced at some some point. But there are a few things in life that are absolutely not replaceable. And that really isn't objects. It's people, our family, our friends, our loved ones, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters. I know it sounds sappy, but it is also true. And I think we need to just hold that in our heads as 2024 keeps on what's really important and what isn't. Anyway, hope this was a fun video for this weekend as we kind of end the winter of 2024 and get into the spring. Please feel free to comment and discuss. And also, yeah, next time we do a live stream, pop in and maybe you'll give me a idea for a video when I need one. Who knows? And again, if you'd like to help support us on Patreon, we're starting to do a new tier involving the sh new shooting range. Check it out. And before we go for good, was out at the cabin land and recorded quite a bit of footage. Here's a little bit just to show you the area. It's still winter, but it's really great when the foliage comes in out there. And we caught a really nice day last week. So here's a second before we really wrap it up. This is Misha. Hope everyone's having a good weekend. Catch you very soon. Next time.